with development pressures, climate change and declining space for connectivity across the Greater Sydney Basin and beyond, there is an increasing need for restorationists, plant producers, planners and landscape architects to collaborate on ensuring natives of the correct provenance and genetics are conserved as well as planted within urban spaces. I'd like to introduce Teen MacDonald. Now, Teen has been involved, uh, she says, for over 35 years. Now, Teen has been involved in restoration and work as long as I can remember, and I've been involved for 40 years, so I, I suspect uh, it's longer than that. Teen is president of Arbor and a board member of the Society for Ecolo Ecological Restoration Australia. Uh, Teen was instrumental in co-authoring the National Restoration Standards for Practice in Ecological Restoration in Australia, and that has really been a, a, a hallmark of uh, a very significant work in this country. And uh, I'd just like to hand over to Teen now. Thank you, Teen. Really, my talk, I'm trying to uh, elicit some uh, enthusiasm from the audience and from managers throughout Sydney to make nature great again in Sydney. Uh, uh, we need cities, um, but there are limits because we need nature too. So I hope to show how the restoration standards help guide recovery in fragmented landscapes in so far as possible in so far as possible, because restoration, obviously, full recovery is in, impossible across the whole of Sydney. We need, uh, humans need to live here. There are some areas that might be large enough to be sustainable, where full recovery might be possible. In other areas, only partial recovery may be possible, but it's still restoration, and we do, uh, we aspire to the highest practicable extent outcome. So uh, Sydney, look, why, why not the bushland city? Uh, I've grown up in Sydney and what has appealed to me and, and most people I know is, is it's fantastic bushland. We've been lucky enough to have the harbour fringed with reserves and national parks in many cases, um, but there are still a number of endangered, even critically endangered ecosystems. And these are increasingly threatened by urban expansion. So, you know, my question is, will we rise to the occasion to restore these or miss the opportunity? Will we, you know, keep Greater Sydney greater or will we, will we make it lesser Sydney in the long term? So the map of Greater Sydney, it looks pretty dismal. Looking at this from, from an aerial, from a satellite photograph, you know, depressed me really. I thought, what am I talking about, restoration in Sydney? However, um, you can't see because the bushland patches are either too small or too fragmented, so they disappear at this scale. But when you look closer, when you're actually in the landscape, there are some substantial patches of bushland um, from our scale, and they still have some potential for sustainability. So ecological restoration in fragmented landscapes depends upon a combination of regeneration, bush regeneration and reconstruction. So gone are the days when we can depend solely on regenerating remnants. Uh, we need to actually link and expand them as well. Uh, science tells us we must do this or populations may not be able to persist in the long uh, term in these remnants, uh, particularly through climate change. What we see here is the current extent of uh, vegetation remaining in the Cumberland Plain. The previous slide circled Cumberland Plain vegetation communities and eastern suburbs Banksy scrub because they are two critically endangered ecosystems. Now, if you look at that, that is the previous extent of the vegetation communities of the Cumberland Plain and that is the current extent. Now, uh, people for many decades have been working on regeneration, as you can see in the top right-hand photo, as well as uh, what is often called revegetation, but the national standards refer to as a reconstruction approach to restoration. This is a picture of the former and current extent of eastern suburbs Banksy scrub. So the 
mauve is the prior extent and the yellow, unfortunately, can you see it, is the uh, current extent of um, just very tiny patches of eastern suburbs Banksy scrub. Again, a lot of uh, attention is being paid to regeneration, which is absolutely appropriate. But the time has also come for reconstruction, uh, expansion and linking, if at all possible. So the national and international ecological restoration standards both emphasise the importance of an integrated approach where we do assisted regeneration wherever possible and where necessary reconstruction. They harmonise both the international version and the um, Australian version. In both versions of the standards, we have a five-star system of, uh, I guess, evaluating and reporting uh, recovery outcomes. So in a wheel such as this, you can communicate a one to five scale of improvements at a site over time. So you use different wheels to do that, or you can use different colours for your prior condition and your now improving condition. Four, six attributes, six ecological attributes. Now, essentially, the top three attributes, uh, physical conditions, species composition and structural diversity could be thought of as, as uh, physical attributes or structural attributes. And the lower three, uh, absence of threats, external exchanges and ecosystem function are more like functional attributes. So what this whole thing is doing is it's encouraging practitioners to look at, at the whole ecosystem and not just the species composition or the structure of the ecosystem, but where is it placed in the landscape? Are there external changes? Are the um, species within the ecosystem uh, functional? Uh, are, the, are the processes occurring? Is uh, are nutrient cycles, uh, energy flows, uh, processes such as fire and natural disturbance, are they all occurring at the scale of, uh, that, that is appropriate for the size of the ecosystem? Just another way of, of um, depicting that, but um, my talk today will focus on species composition, ecosystem function, and external exchanges. So here is uh, the plantation, uh, a um, revegetation project undertaken in 1936 in Broken Hill by <coughs> Albert Morris, who was one of our heroes. <laughs> but uh, we just we we found this when we visited a couple of years ago, the Arbor Field Trip, and we were very excited about it, but we found no recruits. There were no uh, young trees in this 80-year-old uh, plantation. And uh, we know they were native plants to the area. However, we identified that that uh, eucalypt canopy actually would normally have occurred only along the streams rather than in this type of flat site near the stream, the upland site would have probably been more a salt bush community. So perhaps it was an inappropriate reference system that was identified for this particular project. Um, there were some social uh, reasons why they planted trees as well. Um, so the uh, recruitment conditions wouldn't have been there for the, the recruitment of uh, river red gum, which requires flooding and bare ground. Um, but also, we have in our Albert Morris's notebooks a record that he collected all the seedlings for this site from the, probably the same parent. They were, they were a cohort of seedlings that he dug up and put in. So this is just an example that with the best of intentions, it's, it's not just the species alone, but the genetic composition uh, of, of a restoration project if, if we are to restore functionality. So uh, whether expanding or linking areas, where will the uh, ecologically appropriate seed come from? So we're talking here about not just diversity in species, but diversity in, in genetics. So the national standards both and the international standards both have um, an appendix that talks about genetics and fragmentation uh, and uh, how both of those things relate to climate change. Um, and they both cite this very nice diagram that Suzanne Prober and others put together in their publication. And th this is a, a, a diagram showing some models proposed to mitigate loss of external exchanges in fragmented ecosystems. So basically the, the idea is that if you've got fragments, 
they've got two problems. They're small, so the population is not large enough in um, those uh, sites to support a, a broad genetic gene pool. And um, they're also separated from sources of uh, other um, genetic material that might be coming in. So if they're going to be permanently uh, isolated, then we need to make up for that through restoration in some way. And so um, geneticists are telling us that there's a need for us to avoid some bad habits of the past. Now, in restoration, we have tended to um, focus a little on collecting close to the site, as close as possible to the site. So model B, now the legend here is that the star is the site, the restoration site, and the blue circles are the area from which you collect your propagules. And the size of the circle depicts uh, the proportion that you collect from that area. So if you collect all from you immediately adjacent to a very small remnant, you may be in fact collecting propagules from an already inbred population. So this is one of the concerns that people have got. Now this is just in fragmentation. This is not taking into account um, climate change as well. So if, if um, a population is to adapt uh, to climate change, it needs to be genetically diverse so that it can draw upon its genetic heritage to adapt. Um, if it's a small population, it may not have that. So um, you can see here, I'm not arguing for any one of the models here, but Model C focuses most collection in the vicinity of the site, but not at the site. And the other models are variously less conservative, with Model E the least conservative. So in a changing climate, you go to where the predicted climate would be now, and you collect from there to bring back to your site. So there's plenty of um, debate about what might be the best model. I'm just suggesting that we, as practitioners, must take into account these functions when we're thinking about seed sourcing. So some restoration practitioners really are doing that, making a very big effort to do it. Here's an example of the Grassy Ecosystem Reconstruction Project in Victoria, where multiple sites um, were worked Paul Gibson Roy was involved in that project with around about 200 herbaceous species. So there you've got a lot of species diversity and also listening to geneticists to advise on genetic diversity as well. And seed production areas also have been focusing on attempting to do both those things, species diversity and genetic diversity. So these photos are from uh, the Greening Australia Nursery in Western Sydney, Mount Annan Botanic Gardens in Sydney, and uh, the Greening Australia Nursery in Canberra. And you'll hear a lot more about that today. There'll be a lot of talks about the actual nitty gritty and logistics of seed production. Now, where will the appropriate sites come from to link and expand? So we're not just talking here about species composition, we're talking about external exchanges now, that external exchanges attribute that you need to be able to try and tick off. Many of us won't, that's going to be the weakest of our um, uh, attainments. So do we, are they acquisitions um, by government, whether through offsets or uh, some other form of acquisition? Uh, we do have a debt as it is, so uh, it would be sad if we depended entirely on offsets because they do involve destruction and uh, there's uh, uh, no guarantee that there'll be even no net loss, let alone net gain, and restoration is really philosophically meant to be about net gain. Private land conservation, yes. There's a lot of rural and urban initiatives funded through public incentives, and uh, there's also public land that can have dual uses. So retrofitting public parks and gardens, this option is underutilised. A survey of managers of 24 eastern suburbs Banksy sites in 2012 showed that out of 24 sites that were actively worked, 19 of those had at least some potential for expansion. That's not a lot of expansion, but it's some expansion, you know, because they're pretty beleaguered. These sites are in intensely developed areas. Um, two of those sites were subject to ac active expansion in 2012. I'll show you a picture of those in a minute. 17 of those had bush regen, 
happening on them, which is totally appropriate. Uh, those regen sites were getting increases in species, not many increases, but uh, it's appropriate to try that first. Here is an example of dual use in an urban area. Look at this wonderful picture of a, uh, an oval being converted to a, a more passive recreation exercise with soft edges to include these in suburb species, scrub species. Isn't that wonderful? And also um, the New South Wales golf course at La Perouse, you know, it has 12 hectares, which is a large amount comparatively uh, of eastern suburbs Banksy scrub and they're also connecting and linking and planting on their site. This was 12 years ago. So imagination and willingness is really what's needed there. Now, uh, Centennial Parklands, you can see the yellow surrounded, the yellow circled bits are just tiny fragments of eastern suburbs Banksy scrub and not a lot of potential for expansion within the park because there's so much uh, public recreation, passive recreation and ornamental plantings. However, um, Centennial Parklands Trust has control of an area in Queen's Park where there is potential, or at least I believe there is, and uh, we've got people from Waverley Council here today who, who have actually done some planting uh, as a buffer uh, in 2016 and are also um, collaboratively with um, Centennial Parklands doing regeneration of what is circled there, which is a remnant. It's a pretty uh, tiny remnant. Um, the large area that I've hashed, hatched in um, yellow is uh, where I think you know, it's really worth investigating whether t there is potential for, for reconstruction. And the blue area, well, why not put re Eastern Suburbs Banksy scrub species in people's backyards as an, as, an, as, as an activity that can excite the community? So let's get the community excited, really. There's... Uh, no reason for us not to act. It's been seven years since that review and not a hell of a lot has happened. So what is needed for the promise of conservation in Greater Sydney if it, if it does remain Greater Sydney? We do need that imagination and willingness. We need to get the public excited. The managers need to get excited. They need to get committed. So there needs to be greater commitment and collaboration between government NGOs, all sorts of people, to develop um, roadmaps for expanding, linking these remnants, to get sites that are appropriate to link. You know, we've got to do better, haven't we? We really have. That's what the national standards are all about. Let's aspire to the highest practical outcome and uh, see bushland as our heritage. It's our national, natural heritage. Um, we can't live without it. it it's important for our souls. Now, we also need to have strategic actions for incorporating provenance and genetics into propagule supply. So who are the leading agencies for this? How are they progressing? I've got no idea. We're going to hear about these very questions and hopefully get some answers from the other speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>